Okay, so we are online. So welcome again everybody to our Sunday morning Dhamma talk. The topic today is sati or mindfulness, one of the most important terms in the Buddhist teaching and also one of the most important tools we have for realizing the Buddhist teaching. When it comes to Buddhism, I make a strong distinction between Buddhism and Tamism. Buddhism is the Buddhist teaching <coughs> plus all the culture around it. So all the rituals and in each country influenced the Buddhist teachings, so all the rituals, that what made it into a world religion is called Buddhism. If we take Tamism, it's only the deeper practical parts of the Buddhist teaching, like meditation, understanding of the law of karma, and especially using mindfulness meditation to understand the workings of your mind. So Dharma, often translated as the norm, the law, the doctrine, but also justice or righteousness. Dharma is also used in many different traditions and they use it in a wider sense. Dharma meaning any kind of good practice, living a good life, living a life according to the Dharma. In India, I heard the term Sanatana Dharma, which translates as the eternal Dharma. So the Dharma is always there and the Dharma can never be destroyed, but humanity can. So if we do not live <coughs> a l <coughs> sorry. So if we do not live a life in accordance with the law of karma, with uh, in accordance with the Dharma, humanity can suffer and could be destroyed if we go very far off from the Dharma part. But the Dharma will always be there. That's why I say it's not necessary to speak much about the Dharma or to protect the Dharma. But I think we should speak out for the Dharma because we are its voice. So the Dharma doesn't have a voice on its own. We should speak up and we should explain what is a Dharmic life, how to practice Dharma in day-to-day -day life. Ehi Basiko, a very famous term, I used it also last Sunday, uh, means to see things as they are. So every part of the Buddhist teaching can be put to the test. So you can find out for yourself if it is working or not. And actually that is the advice of the Buddha. He said, don't believe anything blindly. Try to find out, is this something good? Is this something useful? And only if you see this is helping me in my day-to-day -day life, then take it as something important. Take it as a part of the Dhamma. The Satipadana Sutta, the foundation of mindfulness, is one of the most important uh, discourses in the Theravada tra Buddhist tradition. In many Theravada countries, like here in Sri Lanka, it is very highly venerated. So they many recite it, they learn it by heart, and at uh, Boya days or at big ceremonies, they recite it and uh, they keep it in high esteem. More important, of course, is to look carefully what is in this uh, text, what is the advice, and how we can practice it. The practical form of this, uh, what comes out from this Satipadana Sutta, is called the Vipassana meditation. So it's the meditation based on mindfulness, using mindfulness as a tool to understand the workings of your mind, watching your mind, and also get a deeper understanding of impermanence or nicca, dukkha and anatta. So what is the biggest sickness in the world? The Buddha says there is no fire like passion, no crime like hatred, no sorrow like separation, no sickness like hunger and no joy like the joy of freedom. But the Buddha also in the same discourse he asks what is the biggest problem or what is the biggest sickness we are facing in the world? Many would maybe give different answers like um, social uh, injustice or whatever, but the Buddha pointed at something a little bit different. So he said the biggest sickness or the biggest problem is mitcha ditti or wrong view. That means, <coughs> that means not knowing what is good, what is bad, not knowing what is the noble part, not, no, not knowing what is beneficial and not knowing what leads to liberation. Like here in this picture we can see uh, Devadatta. He was one, uh, actually was the cousin of the Buddha, so he grew up together with him. 
Later he became a monk and it, it even says that he was good in meditation, but only uh, he developed jhana, so he was good in samadha meditation. But later he developed a, a grudge against the Buddha, uh, always trying to jump up and getting more authority in the Buddhist Sangha, so much so that so, uh, he tried to kill the Buddha twice. And of course, with that messing up his spiritual part, and he said that he is reborn at a very bad place. So Mitya Diti, a wrong view, is the most dangerous thing there. And the Buddha also, <coughs> at another occasion, he said, if somebody has a very strong wrong view, even the Buddha or any holy person cannot save such a man. So if you grasp strongly wrong ideas and you don't have this open mind, you're not ready to take in anything, then nobody can help you on your spiritual path. So therefore he called it the biggest sickness or the biggest problem, the biggest hindrance for your spirit, <coughs> spiritual development. So samsara, the Buddha calls this round of existence, so we are reborn again and again, which is a prison for your mind or your consciousness. So uh, many say we are not human beings, we are pure consciousness having a human experience, and as soon as we are reborn into as a human being, our consciousness is very much limited, limited to these uh, six senses we are having, and that's why many report like this um, close near death experiences. They say they felt unbound consciousness, which is our real uh, sta state of mind, and which we can regain through meditation. So the Buddhist philosophy is often summed up in the Four Noble Truths. Uh, number one, to see our actual state in that there is suffering or there is uh, a problem here. Also number two, <coughs> to see the cause of suffering which is attachment or desire. Number three, how to end the suffering with letting go or with getting rid of all this desire. And the fourth one, the path leading to the end of suffering, so that is the actual technique or the practice, how to free your mind from all attachment. So sape, sankara, anicca, <coughs> everything around us, uh, including ourselves, is impermanent. So all mental formations, all being, all existence is ultimately impermanent. Because it is changing from moment to moment, it is uh, non-satisfactory. And if we uh, look carefully, or especially if you make some get some experience in our meditation, we also can see that ultimately everything is non-self, or the self or the ego is an illusion. There are three types of craving, according to the Buddha. <coughs> One is karma dana, so all kind of sensual pleasures, meaning all the five senses. Pava dana means the grasping of an existence, which usually is very strong, this believing in my being with the I, me, or mine. And the opposite would be vipava dana, non-existence, if somebody is suicidal or he doesn't live, like to live anymore. Uh, they wish not to exist, but uh, as I mentioned many times, and I had a separate Dhamma talk about that, suicide is not a solution. <laughs> Through suicide you cannot end your suffering. Usually after suicide, first of all, you are reborn at a place worse than this one, so you pay off the karma for doing suicide, and then maybe the next life thereafter is a similar life to this one. So it is not a solution, it's uh, taking the problem at the wrong and so letting go is the solution. The attainment of perfect happiness can be only attained through letting go. Through letting go of all desires and attachments, which are uh, especially in connection with the six senses. So if you sit in meditation, try not to grasp anything, just be aware, observe everything with an equanimous mind. And you can retrain the mind not to grasp anything, also not to reject anything. So you stay in the middle with an equanimous mind. 
The Eightfold Path is in detail the path for the practice of letting go, of freeing the mind, starting with right understanding, which has to come like Michaditi is the wrong view, right view comes right in the beginning, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, meaning you have a, uh, have a job or a profession uh, through which you do not harm other living beings. And the last three all have to do with meditation. Right eff effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. So you need, uh, there's the also this big discussion, what should we do, S uh, Samadha or Vipassana meditation? It's very clear that we need both. So we need concentration and we need mindfulness and you need effort to do the meditation or to make some effort to practice your meditation. So the three things we are working on or we try to get rid of is loba dosa moha or greed, hate and delusion. And also s some say it's just the other side of the coin. So if greed disappears, hate also disappears. And if greed and hate disappears, or you need a uh, clear comprehension, so delusion also has to go. So they come in a package. So in meditation, if you also many ask, what is a sign of progress in your meditation? Now, if you can see that your greed, hate and delusion is going down, that means you are practicing in the right direction. If you practice any kind of uh, spiritual meditation, yoga, whatever, and you feel that your greed, hate and delusion is getting more, then definitely you're not practicing the right way. You should change something. So mindfulness is one of the most powerful tools we have to understand the workings of our mind. So in order to get rid of greed, hate and delusion, it is only possible through the cultivation of mindfulness. Mindfulness is also called a faculty, a indriya, it's also called a spiritual power, a bala, and it is also one of the seven factors of enlightenment. And as we have seen before in the Noble Eightfold Path, it is right mindfulness, so one of the eight uh, links to in, in the Noble Eightfold Path. <coughs> So Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing meditation is uh, one of the favorite uh, meditation objects of the Buddha. So using mindfulness to watch your breath. Also the Buddha has recommended about 40 uh, different meditation objects. His favorite one was uh, mindfulness of breathing. It's very easy to understand why from birth to death it's always there, it's automatic. It is also very closely linked to your state of mind. So if you are restless, the breath is getting restless. The moment you calm down, your breath also calms down. So it makes a perfect meditation object. You can use it in your sitting meditation. You can use it during the day. Also there's another like walking meditation. Even there you can use the mindfulness of breathing. So it is one of the main, uh, it is the main uh, object for meditation in the Buddhist meditation practices. So what is the biggest enemy of meditation? Now last time in my Tuesday meditation class I asked the same question. What do you think is the biggest hindrance or the biggest problem for any kind of meditation? What is the enemy of meditation? Hmm. Any ideas? Thinking. thinking, perfect. You were there on Tuesday? <laughs> It's the thinking mind. So the Buddha had a word for it. It's called papancha, proliferation or the thinking mind. So if you sit in meditation, very soon you will start thinking about something. And if the thinking, uh, the thought itself is not the problem, but getting involved in the thinking. So as soon as the thought comes up and you just say, ah, it's a thought, and you just continue, then it's not a problem. Papancha means you get into the thinking mind, so you get carried away by your mind. You get involved in a story that is called Papancha and that makes the biggest hindrance for your meditation. To, <coughs> to stop proliferation, to stop the Papancha, you need mindfulness. So you have need a very strong mindfulness to watch what is going on in your mind. There's also a different meditation where they focus on the gap between the thoughts. And I, I used to do this for a short period. It is also a very powerful meditation. 
So if you're very mindful and you watch where the thoughts arise, you will see that the thought pops up and there's a small gap in between before the next thought is coming up. But what, what you also can see is that you have no control over your thoughts. When a thought arises and which thought arises is completely conditioned by your past karma, you cannot control that. What you can do, as soon as a thought comes up, you can be either grasp it, you get involved in it, or you just note it, ah, this is a thought, and you move on with your meditation. So meditation, especially the Anabhanasati, which is the meditation of breathing, uh, is one of the most powerful tools we have to develop the mind. <coughs> The goal of this meditation is to stop the thinking mind, to stop grasping things, to run, uh, stop uh, running after pleasant things, and to get a mind which is undisturbed and unworried, and a thoughtlessly awareness of the flow of experience in your present life. This is the <coughs> line the Buddha used frequently when he gave some meditation instructions. So he said, having gone to the forest, sitting down at a quiet place, keeping the body erect and his mindfulness alert. Mindfully he breathes in, mindfully he breathes out, and with full knowledge and understanding. So this is the introductory the Buddha always gave for any meditation instruction. Also nowadays it may be difficult to find a quiet forest or a nice tree. You can use it at home, so you get go to your room, lock your door. Important is, uh, th the Buddha used, he liked to meditate outside under a tree in the forest. Important is that it is an empty place or not many things around. And if you have many things in your room, at least that they are orderly, a nice, clean, uh, fairly empty room would be perfect for your meditation. So the idea is that you uh, you don't meditate at a crowded place uh, with less noise uh, where you can find some peace and where you can settle down into your meditation. <coughs> if you do the Anapanasati meditation or the, if you watch your breath, Usually you focus on the tip of the nose. Also there are some meditation systems where you watch the breath indirectly, like the rise and fall of your belly, or some watch it at the chest area. But the most original and I think the, the most uh, recommendable is you watch it directly somewhere here. So where the, uh, the breath touches your nose tip or the upper lip somewhere, you find a spot where you can feel the in and the out breath. <laughs> In the beginning, when you start in meditation, it can also be helpful to do the counting. Some do this, they say each time you breathe in, you say one, each time you breathe out, you say two, or you say just in, out, or anapana. You use some words to keep the attention at your breath. The method of jhana, now Ajahn Brahm is, uh, he is the expert of the jhana meditation. So he talks mainly about some of the meditation, how to go into the jhana, which uh, if somebody can gain jhanic uh, absorption, it's also very much helpful for any other type of meditation and also for vipassana meditation. So the more concentration you can build up, the easier it will be to watch your mind with mindfulness and to get an understanding of what's actually going on in your body and mind. Uh, the Anabhanda Sati, or the, medi uh, the breathing meditation, it has another unique thing about it, that you can use it for both ways of meditation. So you can use it for concentration and for insight, or for samatha and vipassana meditation. If you use it as a purely um, uh, concentration meditation, you usually <coughs> use the word I mentioned, so you say in, out, in, out. You do not watch your mind, you keep the attention only at your breath. If you do the inside meditation, you can still use the breath as the main meditation object, but you're also watching the senses and you are, you're watching how your mind moves away, you label it, you bring it back again. So this, through this movement of the mind, you get an understanding of the impermanence and also about the non-self nature and also about dukkha or suffering. 
Nobody can be told what the Matrix is. Who has seen the movie The Matrix? It's a little bit, ah, very good. <laughs> it's a three, three movies. It's not a new movie, it's fairly uh, quite a few years old, but it's a very, it's an action movie. But in that movie, there is a very underlying, very deep message. And the message is that uh, what they call the matrix is sansara, or our existence, which we are bound up. So, and our reality is a different one. So, uh, the idea in the movie is that we are living in a dreamlike state, and only if we wake up, we can see reality as it actually is. This was one of the main actors in the movie, and he said this line, nobody can be told what the matrix is. And it's very similar to what the Buddha said about samsara or about enlightenment. The Buddha said, <coughs> I can only show the way, but nobody has, uh, ev everybody has to experience it for him or herself. So nobody can be told what samsara or what enlightenment is. The only way to find out, you sit down, you do your meditation, and you try to find out for yourself. So I recommend watching that movie. There's another allegory of the cave by Plato. Uh, he, um, he gave this simile. Let's say somebody is imprisoned in a cave and he is chained up with the face to the, to the inside uh, cave wall. Uh, the door behind him is open, so some people walking by, but he sees only the shadows on the wall. So because he has never seen anything else, for him the shadows on the wall is his reality. So he thinks this is life, this is reality, since he has never seen anything differently. If he would have the wisdom or the courage just to turn around and look uh, towards the entrance, he would see actually the people walking by and he would see how it actually looks. So he gave this as a simile for the illusion we are living in. Again, pointing at the same thing, the Buddha called it Mahamaya, the great illusion, uh, meaning that this existence, or our reality, is not real. And often also, if we make some progress in Vipassana meditation, it is called seeing things as they actually are. So again, pointing at the same thing, there is we are living in a dreamlike state, and there is a way of waking up from it. So this isn't real. That's another line from that same movie. What is real? How do you define reality? If you are talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. So again, <coughs> pointing it in the same direction, Mahamaya or the great illusion. Mindfulness of breathing, developed and practiced, is of great fruit, of great advantage, leading to knowledge and full liberation. So in the Satipadana Sutta, which we go now a little bit more into detail, the Buddha says this is the way of uh, practicing and understanding your reality. <coughs> so this Sutta, the Satipadana Sutta, also uh, often the, it's called the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, in the introductory to this sutta, the Buddha says ekamakko, a Bali word which usually is translated as the only part, the only part to liberation. But eka, ekamakko could also be translated as the straight part to liberation. So either way it's the only or the straight way. Uh, many say it doesn't matter which one is the real translation, it means the highway to enlightenment. So these are the four uh, different ways of doing vipassana meditation as mentioned in that sutta. First one is kaya anubhasana, contemplation of body. Vedana anubhasana, contemplation of feelings. Chitta anubhasana, contemplation of mind. And dhamma anubhasana, contemplation of mental objects. <coughs> So the first one, contemplation of body, can be done in many different ways. Even watching the press, Anapanasati, is a bodily function, so it belongs to the first group, watching your press, using it for mindfulness. The other one would be uh, being aware of your bodily posture, especially when you do the walking meditation, so you're fully aware of your body, like the uh, lifting, moving forward and dropping of your feet. Uh, another way of uh, practicing this meditation is reflecting on the impurities of the body 
or reflecting on the impermanence of your body like we see here in this picture. So mentally you reflect on how you are growing old and one day you get sick, you die, you pass away and you are reborn again, using this as a meditation object. The second one is contemplation of feeling. So in this meditation you, you don't use the breath as the main meditation object, you focus on the sensations in your body. So whenever you feel a pleasant feeling in your body, you are fully aware this is a pleasant feeling. If you are feeling an unpleasant feeling, you are completely aware this is an unpleasant feeling. And uh, this system has been developed and uh, really uh, uh, made famous by Mr. Goenka in his Goenka Vipassana meditation based on his uh, teacher's meditation who was Upakin in Burma. So uh, Mr. Goenka <coughs> developed this uh, Vipassana meditation system where they do this sweeping, they call it sweeping, so they go through the body again and again trying to find sensations, uh, picking up the strongest sensation, just watch it, what is it, and then move on again, sweeping through the body uh, using not one object but whatever is dominant in that moment, use that as your main meditation object. I have done this meditation a few times and uh, it's, uh, it is also one of a uh, very practical way of doing mindfulness meditation. As I'm not doing it anymore, but the 10 day meditation retreats they are offering are very excellently organized, so it's very recommendable to, to do one 10 day retreat. The other one, the next one is contemplation of mind, <coughs> which is uh, citta nupassana. So in this one, uh, you are watching your mind, you watch your senses, that's the one I'm doing and I'm recommending. So uh, also I'm using the breath as the main meditation object, otherwise it is citta nupassana. So you watch the senses whenever your mind wanders away, let's say here a sound, you say oh, it's a sound and you bring the attention back to your breath again. So this is mainly known under the Mahasi Sayato Vipassana meditation. Also there are various variations about it, like in Burma they insist that you watch the rise and fall of the belly as the main uh, object, while I like to watch the press over here. Uh, either way it's working, but there are a few variations about the system. Important is Chitta Nupassana means watching your mind, watching your senses. And the last one is contemplation of mental objects, uh, so you watch a state of mind. It's called Dhamma Nupassana, and here the word Dhamma sometimes leads to a little bit confusion. It's not Dhamma in the sense of the teaching, Dhamma here means a state of mind. So you watch, let's say you're angry, uh, you know there is anger in my mind. You are greedy, you know there is greed in my mind. You're restless, you know there is restless in my mind. So you use a state of mind for your meditation, focus on that and that's a different type of meditation. <coughs> One of the ways of doing this last one, the Dhammanubhasana, is watching the five aggregates of clinging. We had this shortly in my uh, meditation class. So this is an analysis how the mind is grasping and how you create new karma from moment to moment. Rupa here <coughs> would mean something from outside, let's say a sound. Vedana means the connection, so the sound is touching my ear. Sanya means I recognize it, I say, ah, I hear a sound. And, uh, but it's still neutral, and Sankara would mean I give it a validation. I say, I like it, I don't like it. And Vinyana would mean uh, I have already created a new karma, it's going back again into my subconsciousness. Now this, uh, you can reflect on all of these five in this type of meditation. Also in the meditation I am doing, the Jitta Nubhasana, you can break this cycle of creating new karma at the Sanya level, if you note everything with a neutral thought. Let's say I hear a sound <coughs> and I do not grasp the thought, I do not, uh, I do not say I like it, it's a nice music or I don't like this sound. I just say it is a sound and I move on with my meditation. So I stop it at the Sanya level, I do not create a new karma or a new Sankara and there will be no memory going back into my subconsciousness. So whosoever, now this is the, the line the Buddha uh, gave at the end of this Satipadana Sutta. 
So he says, whosoever practices these four foundations of mindfulness, in this manner, and he starts with seven years, he says, if you practice these seven years unbroken, you can expect higher knowledge here and now, full liberation and enlightenment. But then he says, uh, forget about the seven years, even six years is enough for five, he goes down to one year, and then he says, even ten months, one, uh, five months, he goes down to one month, at the end it comes to one week. He says, if you practice unbroken mindfulness just for one week, you can expect higher knowledge here now, full liberation and enlightenment. Only the point is, <coughs> uh, let's say you're sitting down, say I will be now, uh, practice unbroken mindfulness for one day, you will quickly realize it's not so easy to do, so you need years of practice to have unbroken mindfulness. So this is the part, <coughs> This is the path to purification of beings for overcoming sorrow and limitation. So again, he, the Buddha was praising this mindfulness meditation in the high sense. So if you're really serious in practicing, it is a very powerful tool to understand your mind and to actually make some prog progress in your meditation. So there are different ways of how to uh, get rid of defilements. Uh, so in many different traditions, uh, people are working with it. One is meditate on the opposite. So let's say you feel strong burning anger inside yourself. One way is you just practice mindful uh, metta or loving kindness meditation. So whenever you feel I'm really angry in the moment, I'm really upset about somebody, uh, I do metta meditation, so I just focus on the feeling of loving kindness, of compassion, of uh, positive thoughts, and then, <coughs> at least temporarily, that anger will go away. The second way is, <coughs> the second way would be I do the samatha or jhana meditation. So whenever I feel a negative emotion, I try to get into absorption or into strong concentration, which basically wipes out all the impressions from the other senses. So at least temporarily, I'm in a strong, concentrated, blissful state of mind, and I forget about all the other inputs from the other senses. But again, it's only temporarily. And especially about jhana meditation, I say the jhanic bliss can be overwhelming. Uh, and if you do jhana meditation for long periods of time, or you practice it again and again, it can lead to the idea that there are no defilements anymore. Because even after jhana, the defilements only slowly come up again. And if you practice it daily, <coughs> it could lead to the idea that there are no defilements anymore. But in jhana, <coughs> it's only temporary. So you suppress the defilements and at a later occasion, they come up again. The next one would be the Vipassana meditation. So what you do in Vipassana meditation is you face it. So whenever, let's say you're really angry about somebody, in Vipassana meditation, you just watch it. You say, okay, this is anger. But you do not try to get into it or get overpowered by it. As soon as the sword arises, you say, this is anger. I know there's no angry sword, and you move on with your meditation. So you uh, acknowledge it, but you do not give it any extra power and you try to move on with your meditation. If you do this well enough in Vipassana meditation, many strong karmical memories can be cleaned out from the subconsciousness and then actually it will disappear. In Vipassana meditation also, the, <coughs> the main uh, problem again, we say it is Babancha. So whenever a greedy or angry thought comes up, in the beginning it's not, e not difficult to stop the thought. They say all these thoughts are like take paper tigers, so they don't have any power on its own. We actually give it power, we feed it. So when in the beginning, when the thought comes up, it has no power on its own. It's just a very faint idea about anger, whatever, whatever it may be. Then as soon as I grasp it, I feed it, and then it grows, I get into it. And after a while, it can be very difficult to stop this kind of thinking again. So if you're really mindful in the very beginning, you can stop it very easily. This is a thought, this is anger. You should not, in this Vipassana meditation, we do not even say it is anger. We just say, oh, this is a thought, or this is a memory, and we move on with our meditation. And the last one, <coughs> if you really make some progress in meditation, there are stages of enlightenment. 
in which uh, uh, states like anger and greed and delusion actually disappear completely. So if somebody, let's say, attains the third stage of awakening where there is no greed and no hate anymore, then it, uh, it can never come back again. And there is some confusion in many, like I heard this many times in Sri Lanka, uh, monks or some people who claim they have attained that state but are still angry. And uh, or some people, they practice a lot of meditation and uh, maybe for many years they don't see any anger. And then they say, I might be enlightened. And then uh, I, have me I have met a few. <laughs> and uh, so um, one monk came once to Colombo. He used to uh, live in a jungle and meditated really hard for many years, all alone in the jungle. And he was a very good meditator. And for many years, he did not see any defilements anymore because his practice was unbroken and he was always, more or less, always in his meditation. Then one day, <coughs> He had to come to uh, Colombo because all these monks, they usually come once a year to Colombo to extend their visa. He was a foreign monk. And uh, so he, had, he met some other monks there and they had some Dhamma discussions. And one monk was there who really upset him. So he, he had completely different opinions and they had a discussion and he got really ruffled about this monk. And uh, still not realizing that's anger already. So then the other monk pointed out I think you're angry now, Bante. <laughs> and, uh, and, but the good thing of him was he really, uh, he looked back and said, oh my God, yeah, you're right, I'm angry. And so he left immediately back to his forest and continued his meditation. <laughs> so it can be that for many years you don't see any defilements anymore. You think it's already done, but then at certain occasions it can come back again. So the real enlightenment would be if you are completely free from lust and hate, any kind of attachment, any kind of anger, and the mind is very clear and free from defilements. That state can be attained, uh, will take a long time, and I think there are very few who are on that level, but uh, <coughs> it can be attained, and if it happens at any given occasion, there can be no anger anymore. And some also say they have a very odd opinion, they call it uh, Upaklesha. It, there's a Bali word called Upaklesha, which means defilements, very fine defilements. And I heard this once, uh, some people say, you can be enlightened, but you still have Upakleshas, which are memories, just memories. But what is a memory? If a memory comes up and it makes you angry, you're not free from anger. So even if it's, uh, however you call it, uh, if you are free from anger, at no given occasion, the anger can come up again. So if you, and uh, according to also many Burmese meditation teachers, because there are many people in these centers who meditate and who claim, I am this, I, I, ordain, I ordained something. If it's a good teacher, he will be very careful in giving out titles. So he will not say, yeah, you're on level two, level three. Uh, he will say, okay, uh, for many months you should not check your state of mind. Look always, how is it? How do I react? Do I still get angry? What did change in my mind? And only after many, many months of reflection, maybe you can be fairly sure to say I'm at a certain level. And there has been another, <coughs> there have many uh, teachers who did not practice in, in a proper way. There has been one famous teacher in Sri Lanka, he's no more, so I can talk about him. He was in the Kandy area and he uh, was famous for giving out titles. So they had a certain type of meditation and he would like a whole full with people like here. And he would say, uh, you are Arahat and you are level three. And, <laughs> and it becomes a big joke, of course. And many of these people, they really believed it. And so you say, you are level three. And uh, the lady would say, me? Wow, wonderful. And, uh, and so they believed it and they were running around thinking they are half enlightened. And that it's also a very dangerous thing to do out of another reason. <coughs> because uh, let's say I'm somebody tells me I'm enlightened and I believe it, I stop practicing. I, I don't take it so serious anymore. 
I think I'm already safe, so all my job is done, uh, I lean back and I don't do anything anymore. And then maybe in my next rebirth I find out, oh my God, I was deceived, it's wrong, nothing, <laughs> there's nothing. And then you miss the good chance to do some more uh, serious practice. So with these titles we should be very careful and also the Buddha put down a rule, which is not for lay people but for monks and nuns, where the Buddha said, never talk about your own meditation. There's a good reason for it, and some other monks, there's a famous one now, he says, I don't accept this, if you, sh you should openly say what you are, then you attract more people. But the Buddha made this rule for one thing, to safeguard yourself and also to help the others not to get deceived. And uh, naturally, if somebody says, I'm enlightened or half enlightened, it leads to a lot of uh, arrogance on the, on, the, on the part of the monk or the teacher. So we should never talk about our personal experience, only just uh, uh, teach others whatever meditation they have done. So the <coughs> whole Buddhist teaching is a part to enlightenment. In its strictest sense, also it cannot be really called a religion, it's more like a part, a practice, a technique, how to understand your mind. And that is also the universal uh, nature of this uh, Buddhist teaching. When monks and nuns ordain, they recite a formula which since the time of the Buddha has not changed. And the formula starts with Sapa Dukkha Nisarana Nibbana, which means for the overcoming of all sorrow, for all uh, de defilements, I ordain as a monk or a nun. Some monks nowadays, because uh, in many uh, traditional Buddhist countries, they ordain under various reasons. I have met recently a monk who said, I did not ordain to get rid of defilements. And uh, I was a little bit surprised because for me, this if, if it's not for that, for what are you a monk? Uh, that's the only reason why somebody gets into this type of life, to have more time for meditation and for practicing meditation. So the Buddha says, <coughs> I teach one thing and one one only, that is suffering and the end of suffering. As some said, it sounds very negative, Buddha always talking about suffering. Again, it's not negative, it's very realistic. So we say this is our situation, and I think nobody can say there is no suffering in our world. And uh, this is the situation, but I show you also the way out. If you practice properly, you can overcome this suffering and you can free your mind. So it's also very optimistic. So there is an invisible prison around us, <coughs> take it either as this matrix idea or take it just as you are imprisoned by your own mind, by your own grasping, by your own attachment, so that is holding you back, you let go, uh, you free your mind from desires and you move on to a different level of consciousness. Osho, a famous Indian yogi, said this, no meditation means no life. No meditation and you will know life. Also, on a, this comes also from the Buddhist teaching, but I heard it also in many different traditions. Meditation is the medis medication or the medicine for a sick mind. And the Buddha in a wide sense said everybody uh, is mentally, we have problems, mm, if you don't want to call it sickness, but there are problems and the meditation is the medicine for the sick mind. Blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth by Albert Einstein, meaning <coughs> if you believe anything strongly uh, in an authority figure, in a holy book or whatever, your progress towards enlightenment will be limited. And blind belief, too much trust sometimes literally can kill you. And, uh, but why I mentioned it, it is uh, holding on to anything strongly means you're not, you don't have an open mind. And without having an open mind, uh, it will be very difficult to accept new experiences in your meditation. Also many then start asking, why do we have religions at all? Many religions are a set of strong beliefs and uh, they often also ask for blind belief. But I think all of these religions originally have been a part to understanding your mind and uh, freeing your mind. Over the ages, of course, many, many have been changed and are used now for different ideas. In the famous Kalama Sutra, 
<coughs> the Buddha said this, <coughs> don't believe anything only because you read it in a holy book or a saint or a famous teacher has said so. Or even don't believe what I, I, the Buddha says. Do not even believe that. But examine it, find out for yourself, practice, reason about, think about it, and only after you yourself have seen that this is something positive, this is something good, then accept it as a true Dhamma, as something value, a valuable in your life. There was another famous teacher, and I think he was one of the, I regard him as one of the most outstanding spiritual teachers. Uh, he passed away, but not too long ago. But he was a very special uh, spiritual teacher coming out from India, was uh, officially Hindu, but he was not bound up by any religion. He was basically teaching Dhamma or the path to liberation. And he, uh, he was famous for talking about authority or he, he did really didn't like authority. So it goes through like a red line through all his books uh, and he says this about authority. All authority of any kind, especially in the field of thought and understanding, is the most destructive evil thing. Leaders destroy the followers and followers destroy the leaders. You have to be your own teacher and your own disciple. So J. Krishnamurti, <coughs> and there are many uh, books about him, talks mainly about don't grasp anything strongly, keep an open mind, just practice meditation, understanding, and you can, you will be able to free your mind from all defilements. Also what I want to say about before that blind belief, when I, uh, you can use that term in different uh, settings, so the, the way I use it, if I say blind belief, it's not bashing about other religions. I mean it in a wider sense, any kind of strong belief. And that we had this in a dumb, uh, meditation class recently. You can either grasp a religious idea, a political idea, or even if you say Hollywood is the, the, the best football club. Is it Hollywood, no? The, uh, in Melbourne, no? the number one club, no? Uh, no? Not Hollywood, what's it called? Yeah, Collingwood. <laughs> uh, she says it's not number one, but let's say you have a strong idea, this club is the best and all others are much, much less. Uh, you hold on to this idea and you will see all the, uh, the news about football, you will see it in a different light. So uh, just as an example, when I say blind, believe anything you grasp strongly. My next Dhamma talk, by the way, next Sunday will be about blind belief and uh, we'll go into detail about that. On the positive side, <coughs> We can see worldwide there is a great awakening happening, what some call this speeding up or awakening, people are waking up, people are turning more spiritual, more interested in meditation, and some say humanity actually is entering a new phase, a shift in consciousness uh, leading to more peace and happiness. So even the vibrations around us are changing, and human beings are learning spiritual. And the good thing about that is if more and more people start practicing spirituality or meditation, uh, the vibrations become more suitable for newcomers. So if somebody decides to start now with meditation and uh, more people around him are already spiritual, they will find it much easier to get into the spiritual part. Let's say you live in a country <coughs> where nobody is meditating, nobody is practicing spirituality. If somebody wants to try it there, it will be very, very difficult. In a country like Australia, where the spirituality is growing very fast, and especially if you come to a place like this, sitting in a hall like this, which has been used for many, many years for spirituality and for meditation, you will find it much easier to get into your meditation. So the good thing is about this awakening that others will also find it easier to start and then the, the vibrations around us will even speed up much faster. There's a famous meditation teacher in America Brian Weiss, and there's another one actually do are talking about this, they talk about the critical mass. And they say if just, uh, they give a figure about 5%, they say if just 5% worldwide would be spiritual and meditating, that would be enough to change society for the better. I'm not sure about the 5%, but I'm sure about the critical mass, maybe it's 10 or 15%. In any case, it is much less than 50. So we don't even need uh, <coughs> half of the world population, 
but let's say at least 20% of the world is spiritual, meditative, knows what is good and bad, that alone would be enough to topple the whole world, global society and to make something completely better. So in that way we are working for the greater good as well, but mainly the teaching is there first to develop your own mind, to find your own liberation, and then also through your vibrations or through your service later you can also help the others. So Buddhism is all about enlightenment. <coughs> so enlightenment means the realization that we are all infinite consciousness. Others may call it God, pure mind, moksha, Buddha nature, mahasamadhi or just total freedom. So whatever label you use for that uh, experience, uh, we are pure consciousness and that's what we want to realize. Somebody asked me recently, uh, we talked about meditation and she said, so it's then all about rising your, raising your consciousness. And I said, yes, that's all the point. So we are limited consciousness in this human experience. All these uh, yoga and meditation systems have been designed to free your mind again, to go back to your uh, real potential of infinite consciousness. So with that I come to the end, exactly 10.30, you see. I come to the end of this uh, Sunday Dhamma Talk. <coughs> so I hope that all of you will be well and happy. Uh, enjoy your meditation, may you find peace and happiness. Continue on your spiritual path and may you all uh, attain higher stages of consciousness, freedom and liberation in this very life. Sad, sad. Sabitio vivacantu, saparogo vinasatu, Mati pavatantarayo, sukidiga yuko bava, Apivadana silesa, nichang vata bajaino, Chattaro dhamma vadanti, ayurna sukang balanti, sadasaja. <coughs>
but on the in the in the, the whole world, if you look at the whole world, and not only the Buddhist teaching, but in general spirituality, any kind of meditation, and even yoga and these practices, is growing very fast. So we can see that humanity uh, is very much interested now in uh, understanding uh, meditation, doing something mentally. It could be already a side effect of the going down. Also, that people see. Uh, now, worldly, in, in the developed countries, we have everything. We have money, we, we are living very comfortably. But then people see, I'm still not happy. So still, I have everything I ever wanted, but I'm still not happy. There's something wrong with my mind, or the, I can't still find any peace and happiness. So that may be one reason why more and more are searching in developed countries, searching for meditation. Uh, <coughs> But we can also see that the urge or the people are starting to wake up in the sense they see society is not going in the right direction, something is going wrong, so they turn spiritual. Or some also say that population is getting divided right now. Uh, one part, all know there's not something is going wrong. So half of them s turn spiritual and say this is the solution, they go deep into meditation, they want to do something that way. The others, they force themselves to go even deeper into the materialistic side and think the solution lies there. Uh, but if you look at the numbers, globally uh, the meditative people are growing very fast and maybe it is the last period, like if you take the uh, I don't want to go into detail now, but there are some say that this may be the last generation where we have real free will, because more and more this uh, AI and all this you know, globalization is going on. Uh, that may be the last chance that we really can do something mentally and make some progress. But uh, the good thing now we can see there is a growing and is a perfect situation now for doing something mentally. And if we use this opportunity, I think many of you can really make, make it right now. <laughs> okay, yeah. Anything else you want to do? Ask? I, I saw you thinking, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I was given some <coughs> pictures in the phone mm. showing that the monks smoking, drinking, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. yeah mm. that sort of thing. <coughs> and then the, 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 the sender mm. appeared to wish me to comment something. I didn't uh -huh, say anything. Uh, mm. I would like to hear from Bante. Yeah. Uh, monks uh, smoking and drinking. <laughs> those and, uh, yeah. uh, Just smoking, like uh, yeah. womanizing and ah, this yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, so, okay. Mm, mm. but I felt that it's... Mm. So this is just a small group of mm. people and they might not yeah. be mm. monks anyway. Mm. And if they did that, it's, it's mm. their karma, yeah. I mean, yeah. to do... Yeah. To, to mm. That's what I say in uh, now many uh, Buddhism, also the ritualistic side is growing. And uh, in especially in traditionally Buddhist countries, many are ordaining as monks or nuns less, but also under different opinions, uh, different ideas. Now, if you are just born in the Buddhist family and you become feel like becoming a monk, often later it turns out to be like a business. So you run your temple and uh, you're not really, there, many of them are not really interested in meditation or doing something any spiritual. That's why mo one monk, I don't say his name, uh, he famously said, I did not become a monk to get rid of my defilements. No? I have other ideas and then, oh, you what else? No? Uh, but his idea is he's running a temple and I don't even say that he's doing bad things, but he's like doing all the, keeps up the rituals for um, a group of people, which is fine, it's a, it's a kusala, but the deeper part is not there anymore. No? And so and I think when you get this idea, I'm just, you know, I'm doing some social service, I have a temple, I take care of people, do the chanting, and. Uh, it's Kusala, it's a Kusala, but then also you get the idea, uh, because I'm not working for enlightenment or understanding my mind, then maybe they even smoking or drinking is not something far away f of f from their ideas. But if you are then really with the idea to really work on your mind and to understand and liberate your mind, then you would be very careful with doing anything like that because you would always see it, it's a distraction or it's maybe holding me back, so you would stay clear of that. Also shortly before the Dhamma talk, <coughs> I talked with uh, Mr. Adrian, our president. We talked about a certain book. There's one book, it's called Malinda Banya. It's uh, the, the question of King Melinda. It's a huge book. 
but in that book you can clearly see there are two parts of the book. So one is the older part, which is a wonderful Buddhist uh, book. It's deep Dhamma, nothing you can say is wrong in that part of the book. The second part is very weird and you, even the language is different and uh, uh, they, they try to uh, uh, argue about certain points which make no sense and it looks like it has been added later and put into later just to justify certain wrongdoings of monks. And uh, one of them, we, I have a different opinion also about vegetarianism. Uh, I believe the Buddha was a vegetarian. Many monks will disagree with that one. But the one point is also there, which really you can really see, oh my God, this must be later. And uh, there it says, <coughs> if you see anything wrong in a monk, let's say you see a monk and you see him doing anything wrong, like smoking or drinking, uh, don't worry, don't care about that, because he is from the lineage of all the monks, and you remember the first monks, like Sariputta Mokkalana, and so when you see something wrong in the monks, uh, it's not really wrong, because he is from that lineage. No? So it's mainly like saying, uh, if you see monks doing wrong things, it's still good, <laughs> and which is totally wrong in my opinion. But in the book, they try to argue this kind of thing. So don't worry about seeing anything wrong, because in a deeper sense, it's still fine. No? Uh, but I think if you see this kind of things, of course, it, uh, people get unhappy about it. And you can also see that they are not really working for enlightenment. But in certain traditions, uh, monks are smoking. No? Like in, I think in Burma, monks are, they, it's, uh, they smoke. And it's not, uh, they don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, different cultures, different <laughs> different things, but I think it doesn't fit together really with the monk, yeah. Okay, yeah, anything else? What's the time? Okay, one more question, if you have any. <coughs> hmm? Nothing online, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, just now we saw one of the pictures about the um, great hatred delusion and there were three types <coughs> of animals mm -hmm. in the pictures. Mm. Um, why those three animals? Why not, uh, you know, tiger, elephant, all sorts, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder. I I'm not sure now, but I think that picture is from a Chinese tradition and they pictured as, this, I can't even remember what the animals were, but I think they, they pictured as uh, a symbol for greed, hate and delusion. And I think that came from some Chinese tradition where they pictured as these three types of animals. Uh, I can't remember what the animals now were, but uh, uh, it's not so important. So the point is the greed, hate and delusion are the three main negative states of mind which we try to overcome in meditation. And as I said, every tradition will have a different interpretation, but also you can see of these deeper Dhamma points in uh, if it is Chinese Buddhism or Zen Buddhism or Tibetan or Theravada, the, on the main points they all agree, so it's all the same there. Because also uh, the unfortunate thing that happened in Buddhism is that split up into two or three groups now, and sometimes they're not very friendly with each other. And, uh, but when, if you look carefully, the practice, the meditation, and the deeper parts are all the same. No? So they, they all respect the Buddha, they all want enlightenment about this greed, hate, and delusion. They all agree on the basic points. And what is really different is the cultural things. Uh, of course, each country mixed in some culture. They, the dress is different, and they focus on different discourses of the Buddha. Like they are, they all agree on the same discourses. But in, like in Zen Buddhism, they say these three are the most important ones. In Theravada, they say no, these other three are the most important ones. But there is not much, not much difference. No? It, not if it comes to the practice. No? And uh, in Sri Lanka, for example, where I usually live. I sometimes purposely wear the Mahayana Buddhist robe. And, uh, and I know they don't like it. So when I'm there, <laughs> then because I want to show there's not such a big difference, they are also Buddhists, we are brothers, it's no big difference. And sometimes when people come up and they look at me and they say, oh, oh, is this Mahayana? What is this? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> and then I say, yeah, this is a Mahayana Buddhist robe. And then they say, mm, Mahayana is no good. No. And then, then, then I will ask them, what is the difference between Theravada and Mahayana? And they usually say, 
I don't know, but it's no good. <laughs> so they don't know really what's the difference, but it's just a conditioning that that is something not good and this one is better. No? And if you really uh, look into it a little bit, you can see there's no big difference. No? And also with the dress, as it started, they said the Buddhist monks from India came over to China, they're wearing this kind of robe without the shirt, so shoulder open. And then in Chinese culture, it's a li little bit like half naked. No? And so there was one of the kings who then said, I, this is not nice how the monks run around. And he designed a different, or they designed a different dress with the trousers and the shirt and being more covered. And so then it became the Mahayana Buddhist robe dress. And it's just a different way of dressing. The Buddha also left it fairly open of how to wear the robe. So he did not make any strict rules. He just said, arrange the robe on the left shoulder and keep the le left free. Or if you wear a shirt, you can't see the shoulder. So I don't see a big difference between these traditions. And I usually try to you know, uh, make the gap less big <laughs> between the groups. Yeah. OK, thank you. <coughs> yeah, I think so with that we will stop. So thanks everybody for coming. We had a nice uh, group today. So uh, thanks everybody for coming and have a very nice Sunday. Thank you. <coughs>